Um, that introduction was so kind that it made it sound as if we had a, a, a great idea of what we were doing when we um, started this 350 thing, or even now. And we really don't. Um, um, no one really has a great idea about how to build political movements. It's much more an art than a science. And we were completely clueless about how to do it when we began. Um, um, I mean, I, this is the furthest thing from being my life's work. I'm a writer. I'm not even a professor. You know? I'm, a, I'm so antisocial that I'm a writer. My, you know, given my brothers, I would like to sit in my room and type. Okay, that's what writers do. But. But at some point, and I think it actually, the roots of it were in a trip, uh, a reporting trip I'd been on in, in Bangladesh. Uh, people here been to Bangladesh? Incredibly beautiful place. If you're in that part of Asia, you should go. Uh, very crowded, 150 million people in an area the size of Wisconsin. So one of the most crowded places in the world. But they feed themselves. It's the uh, delta of the great sacred rivers of Asia, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. They come pouring out of the Himalaya on their way to the Bay of Bengal. Bangladesh is, is sort of where they flatten out, and it couldn't be more beautiful. Uh, it's in trouble from climate change. The Bay of Bengal is rising, and the salt front is coming in. Those glaciers are dwindling. When I was there, though, the problem they were having was more acute and immediate, not chronic. It was the first big outbreak of a disease called dengue fever, uh, a mosquito-borne disease that is spreading like wildfire around the world right now because, well, because mosquitoes truly dig the warm, wet world that we're... If you were looking at the world from a telescope, from some other planet, trying to figure out why we were altering our atmosphere here, what our goal was, okay? You could do worse than to hypothesize we had embarked on some kind of big mosquito ranching venture, you know? Because that's really, you know, about the, 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 the main beneficiary. At any rate, there were lots of people dying of dengue when I was there. And I was spending a lot of time in the slums, so eventually I got bit by the wrong mosquito. I was sick as I ever was. Clearly I didn't die because I was strong and healthy going in. But I remember going to the hospital ward, more people, you know, much bigger than this, and just people lined up in cots and shivering from this stuff. It's a nasty, nasty thing. And the main thing I remember thinking is, this is so unfair. When the UN tries to measure how much carbon each country in the world emits, you can't even get a number for Bangladesh. It's a rounding error in the calculations. People, you know, bicycle rickshaws, how you get around. Most people aren't connected to the electric grid. They're not causing the problem. 4% of us who live here are about 20% of the world's CO2. We're the league champions by quite a bit. Um, so when I came back to Vermont, I, you know, I wanted to do more than just write about this, but didn't know what to do. Um, uh, you know, I live in the woods in the second smallest state in the Union. I, I called up a few of my writer friends in Vermont and said, Here, here's the plan. We're going to go to Burlington, which is our main city. It's only 50,000 people, so not overpoweringly big, but it's what we have, you know, and we're going to go and we will um, sit in on the steps of the federal building and we'll be arrested and there'll be a little story in the paper and we will have done something. All these other writers were exactly as clueless as I was. And oh, that sounds like a good plan. Let's <laughs> Someone of them happily called up to the police in Burlington. Now, what will happen if we carry out this intrepid stunt? And the police said, nothing will happen. Stay there as long as you want. <laughs> so we had to recalibrate. And um, I sent out emails to everybody. So we're going to go for a walk. And we left uh, a couple of weeks. <laughs> A couple weeks later, from <laughs> Robert Frost's old uh, summer writing cabin up in the Green Mountains. He's our patron saint, you know, and off we walk. And uh, we walked for five days and we slept in farm fields at night. And 
uh, I'm a Methodist Sunday School teacher, so I called up the Methodist, you know, mafia along the way to make sure that there would be potluck suppers, which are kind of the Methodist sacrament, would be available, you know, as we walked. And we, um, we finally got to Burlington, and there's a thousand of us walking. Now, you all live in the shadow of the great metropolis here, and so you a thousand people is, you know, you can control yourselves in that kind of crowd. But in Vermont, uh, with the exception of University of Vermont hockey games, that's really as many people as ever assembled in one place at one time. And it, it was more than enough to get all our candidates for Congress and Senate to come meet with us. And this was 2006. And, and not just meet with us, they all signed this piece of cardboard we've been carrying across the countryside that said, if I'm elected, I'll work to cut carbon emissions 80% by 2050, which at the time was a very radical idea endorsed only by scientists, not politicians. But they all signed, and not just the liberal Democrats. The woman who was running for Congress on the Republican ticket had said two months earlier, um, I'm not sure, but she announced it, I'm not sure global warming is real, more research should be done. Which I think actually these days would pass as a very progressive position within the Republican Party. But, but in, in, in any event, uh, 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 it turned out that the more research that needed to be done was on the topic, how many people will walk across Vermont and ask me to change my mind? And empirically, a thousand was sufficient because she signed. Which was good and it was the way it was supposed to work. The only down was to read the story in the newspaper the next morning. It said that that thousand people may have been the biggest demonstration about climate change that had yet taken place in the United States. Okay? So when we read that, I thought, there's really a reason we're losing this political fight. We have the superstructure of a movement here. We have Al Gore, we have scientists, we have engineers, we have policy people, we have all these fine minds, the only part of the movement that we have forgotten to construct was the movement part. There's nothing there, okay? It's no wonder that no one pays any attention, because there's nothing to force them to. And we began to see if we could try and build that. And at first, we worked in the United States. And um, when I say we, uh, me and seven undergraduates at Middlebury, okay? These guys were seniors, so they weren't done with school, but they were done with school, and, and we, uh, 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 we organized that spring about 1,400 demonstrations around the U.S., and we actually got Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton to both adopt this 80% by 2050 thing, and we were feeling quite smug, except that that summer, 2007, was when the Arctic really began to melt, and it was a summer when it became clear just how fast things were sliding. I spent the summer talking with scientists I'd known for a quarter century who had always been worried, and now they were panicked. And saying, look, things are just happening way faster than the models indicate. We really have got to step up the response. By the time this summer was over, clear that our old targets were obsolete. What happens in 2050 is uninteresting compared to what happens in 2020. And it was clear that really, we weren't going to do this one light bulb at a time, and we weren't going to do it one country at a time. We're really going to have to try to do things as much as we could one planet at a time. Which was a daunting thing to realize. People really don't do much planet-scale organizing, because the planet turns out to be a large place, and because all across it, people annoyingly insist on speaking their own language. Okay, And this makes it extremely difficult to do the kind of thing you would do. So we were both horrified and elated to read a paper in January of 2008 that our greatest climate scientist, Jim Hansen, and his NASA team put out. And that paper said, we now know enough from looking at paleoclimatic records and real-time observation to finally say how much carbon is too much. So any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. Quote, unquote. Strong language for scientists to use. And of course, much stronger still, when you know, as you guys all do, that the, you know, uh, 
atmosphere in Oberlin and Odessa and every place else on the planet is about 391 now parts per million CO2. We are way too high. That's why the Arctic is melting. That's why this is a present crisis, not a future threat. Um, it was a terrifying and, and very sad paper. But it also gave us a clue for how to organize. You wouldn't normally pick a number, a wonky scientific data point, as your kind of rallying cry. It's really not as good as I have a dream or whatever. Right? But Arabic numerals have the useful property of crossing linguistic boundaries. So it means the same thing no matter where you are, you know, in, in Cleveland and Canberra and any other place in the world. 350 means the same thing. So we decided, I mean, that was, well, we had a couple of assets. One, everybody had now graduated. That was good. No more papers to get in the way. And two, there were seven young people, and there are seven continents. So it was almost a perfect match, you know. Um, uh, everybody took one. The guy who took the Antarctic also had to take the Internet, because it's kind of its own <laughs> continent. <laughs> Off we went, and our job, ludicrous as it sounds, was simply to organize, to find people like ourselves. And in most places, they weren't people who thought of themselves as, quote, environmentalists, unquote. They were people who were working on food and hunger, <coughs> on public health and their communities, on social justice of all kinds, on women's issues, on all the things that are called into question in a changing planet, working on all the things that nobody is working on in Pakistan right now because they're busy trying to put a tarp over people's heads, all right? And so these people understood right away what it is we were getting at and why we were getting at it. And we, we did these training camps for young people all around the world, uh, you know, one in central Turkey for Central Asia, one in the Caribbean, one in Johannesburg. We brought a couple of kids from pretty much every country in Africa. And most had never left their country before or you know, been on an airplane or anything. But they immediately understood what we were talking about. And, uh, uh, and just great organizers. They spread out back across Africa. We didn't hear much from them for the next six months because yeah, much of Africa, anyway, the internet's still kind of notional. You can't just Skype people. And that's all we ever had money to do is just Skype people. You know? But we knew they were working. We told everybody <coughs> that we're going to do their first big day like this will be the 24th of October in 2009. It'll be kind of a coming out party for this number. We don't know what you, you'll know what best to do in your place. But do something. Make some noise around that number that day. And we didn't know what really to expect. We got the first clue that it was going to work. Two days early, on October 22nd, we were borrowed this little office. In Lower Manhattan, we were doing all the last-minute chores, you know, putting out the press releases and that kind of thing, and sitting around, mostly just waiting. Um, and we got a phone call. It was from an 18-year-old in a great, great young woman in Lily, in uh, Addis Ababa, capital of Ethiopia. And she was almost in tears on the phone. She said, Mr. Bell, the, the government has taken away our permit for Saturday. Ethiopia, not a very nice government. Um, 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 they've taken it away. We can't do our thing that we were. So we're doing it today before they can stop us. And we are really sorry. We know we're jumping the gun. We really don't want to spoil it for everybody. We're so looking forward to doing the same day as everyone. We're really sorry. And we have 15,000 young people right now out in the street in Otis chanting 350. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, it's all right about the date. Don't worry. <laughs> And pretty soon we had pictures. In fact, it was an interesting story. I said, we need the pictures right away. And like, I said, well, that's the problem. The internet's down. Is you, you know, we can't get you the, oh, we were dying, because we need these pictures to show CNN and whatever. This is going to be real and big. So I could hear one of my colleagues sort of on the phone to Otis shouting in kind of pigeon amharic over a satellite connection with people trying. Turns out there's one big Western fancy hotel which is where I think all the kind of development people go when they go to Ethiopia. And, and it's like an intercontinental or a Sheraton or something. And it had internet in the lobby. Well, the first three people that tried to go in to send the picture were some combination of too young and too black to be welcome in the lobby of the intercontinental. They got kicked out and they finally found some white lady. And 
uh, handed her the computer and she went in and bought a drink and pressed the button and then we had the picture. Um, and we had it up on CNN shortly after that. And after that, they just flowed in for uh, the next 72 hours. And it was really amazing. The next one came from US soldiers in Afghanistan. So we're making a 350 with sandbags and we're parking our Humvee for the weekend and walking, you know? And, and uh, that was as unexpected, even more unexpected. And after that, I'll just flip through a bunch of these. I just, I basically want to just give you a picture of who your colleagues, who your brothers and sisters around the world are in this fight. And the main thing I want you to notice because it's striking and important, I think. Uh, I've listened to people say a number of times over the years, oh, environmentalism is something for rich white people who have taken care of their other problems. This turns out to be not true. Most of the people we work with are poor and black and brown and Asian and young because most of the people in the world fall into those categories. And oddly enough, they're just as interested in the future as anybody else, maybe more so, because the future is pressing down harder on them than it is on us. And so it was quite remarkable to see these pictures just arriving from places uh, you know, I'd never heard of. And some places, I, we had 300 big rallies across India. That's the India Youth Climate Network. But some places we couldn't even identify. Some place in Buddhist Asia, you know, I just loved the picture. And, some of them from places incredibly poor. These are dugout canoes on the Congo River, someplace above Kinshasa. They didn't have a digital camera. They took a picture and developed it in a, somebody's home darkroom. It didn't come out very well, so they had to write in what their banner had said, but they got it to us. And, you know, just so many and so powerful and creative. There were two or three hundred underwater demonstrations. There were actually 350 people that day on the Great Barrier Reef. Huge. There had been a big flood in Istanbul the week before, or two weeks before, so we had six, seven big demonstrations there. Great, beautiful art. That's from the Space Needle. That's the colors of the Venezuelan flag. That's, a, that's an operating room in Puerto Rico. Hopefully they didn't stop for too long. Uh, uh, just, you know, um, uh, beautiful, beautiful images from all over the place, great involvement, really for the first time in this kind of work by religious communities. That's the head of uh, Muslim South Africa, the kind of head of indigenous native traditions behind him, Archbishop Tutu's successor as Anglican Archbishop, head of a big multi-faith march across Cape Town, Pentecostal school in Ghana. That's Billy Graham's alma mater in uh, Illinois, the most important evangelical college in the country. There wouldn't have been an environmental demonstration there even a few years ago, and it's a very good sign that young evangelicals are, are taking significant role in this work. I'd been to Bethlehem to organize, hard place even to get to, but the Dead Sea is shrinking very rapidly as the temperature rises. People wanted to do something together. There's too many military checkpoints. The Jordanians said, we'll do the three. The Palestinians said, we'll make the five along our shore. The Israelis said, we'll do the zero. Uh, you can see the little shadow of the airplane there taking the picture. Um, it was beautiful, powerful to see people uh, sitting this, putting aside other problems and coming together. And there were lots of these kind of iconic, so it was a, uh, you know, autumn afternoon, Saturday afternoon in the U.S., so of course there there's the Syracuse cheerleaders helping us out. Uh, one of the pleasures of this wonderful uh, winter and spring has been hearing from our colleagues in Egypt and Libya and Tunisia and Yemen and uh, you know, every place else, because of course exactly the same people who do this kind of work are the same people who've been in Tahrir Square and whatever all winter long. But pretty much every place, people just doing amazing stuff. Uh, 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 that's the um, that's Soweto, the heartland of resistance to apartheid. They did 350 bungee jumps, but the um, <laughs> the, the most important part, and there's a note saying we've. Um, strung the bungee line between the cooling towers of a defunct coal-fired power plant. This is the highest and best use of coal-fired power plants <laughs> here before. David, you told me there was a coal-fired power plant still here on campus, so this is its, you know, hopefully its eventual fate. <laughs> the Odelin bungee jump in. There's, a, there's my daughter in there someplace. Uh, uh, we're losing our um, maple trees, or we will, as the temperature rises. So those are sap buckets. 
350 big rallies across China, not an easy place to do these. One of them did get busted up by the police, but the others, they you know, knew how far to go. That's a China Youth Climate Network making a human wind turbine, and behind them you can see the largest wind farm in the world. Uh, 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 basically just beautiful, beautiful, powerful. Those are the um, Student Government Association of the Maldives, an amazing place, absolute paradise. Uh, archipelago of 1,200 islands in the Indian Ocean, incredibly beautiful, entirely Muslim nation. Um, the highest point in the country is a meter and a half above sea level. Um, so the Student Government Association held their meeting in the lagoon. The president of the country, Mohammed Nasheed, taught his entire cabinet how to scuba dive, and they held an underwater cabinet meeting to, against their dying coral reef to sign this 350 resolution. They're a good place. Uh, place after place after place, and, and it kind of worked. It was the lead story on Google News for 36 hours, uh, which meant there were more stories linking to it than anything else going on in the planet. And I think one of the reasons was that they were happening in so many places that to kind of journalists didn't look like they should be full of environmentalists, you know. Um, look, that zero there in Yemen is made up entirely of women in full black burqa. Every bit as environmentalist as anyone in this room. Uh, Oil-rich sheikhs in the oil-rich sheikhdom of Abu Dhabi, but smart oil-rich sheikhs, you'll notice behind them the edge of the largest solar array on the planet. They're uh, smart enough to translate their oil wealth into something else. Well, they've got it, you know. Um, um, place after place, and I confess, uh, six or seven hundred photos that were labeled 350 adorable. Um, 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 and some of them were incredibly adorable and incredibly sad. You know, in 1911, there were a lot of refugees in the century we just came through because we had wars and things, not as many as there'll be this time. But in 1911, nobody could sit down with people and say, you are going to be, this person is going to be a refugee before the century is out. Those girls almost certainly will be refugees. Uh, and through no fault of their own. So we had all this big day. In fact, CNN said it was the most widespread day of political activity in the planet's history. And that was good. And, you know, I wish I could tell you that it had been completely successful. Six weeks later, we had this big climate conference in Copenhagen. Um, and we had a lot of momentum, and it was pretty good. And we got 117 nations to sign on to this 350 target, and that was good. But of course, they were the wrong 117 nations. They were all the poor ones, um, all the ones that are most badly damaged most quickly. And the richest and most addicted ones, led by our own, wrecked the whole conference, refused to do anything, walked away from it. Um, and that was a great sadness. And it was a great sadness six months later when the Democratic-controlled Senate decided not even to take a vote on the mild, tame, tepid, moderate climate bill that was before it. And that President Obama offered no real leadership to make that happen. That was a shame, too. And I was afraid that this whole movement would just kind of wither away and die. And so I was really happy, and I'm grateful to you all for playing a part. Last fall, a year later, when we did the second of these things, uh, that my forebodings um, notwithstanding, it was bigger than it had been the year before. We did this thing called the Global Work Party, and people put up solar panels and dug community gardens and laid out bike paths. And at the end of the day, people put down their shovels or their hammers and picked up their cell phones and called whatever they had. You know, president, prime minister, politburo, whatever. I said, look, we're getting to work, what about you? And it was a beautiful day, and there were 7,400 of these events in 189 countries, every country on Earth but North Korea. And that was good and powerful, and, 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 and we'll do that stuff again this September 24th. Circle the date. Well, it doesn't even circle the date on your calendar. Tap the date into your device. Um, um, September 24th, we're doing another sort of global thing, and it'll be very beautiful. This one based around mobility. We're calling it Moving Planet, and it's going to be mostly bicycles all over the planet. And uh, that's because bicycle is one of the very few tools that both rich people and poor people use. You know? And so it's a great chance for 
real solidarity and for great beauty. The thought of, you know, a few thousand bicyclists circling the Ohio Capitol or run around the White House or wherever it is will be a, 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 a visual reminder of what's going on. But